A common argument made against the search for extraterrestrial intelligence in radio is that we've been looking for over 50 years and haven't seen anything other than a few ambiguous candidate signals that never repeated. That in turn might mean that intelligent alien life probably doesn't exist, or at least very close to Earth. This really isn't the case simply because when you get into the nuances and realities of SETI, the reality is that we have barely looked. This is a multi-layered problem that faces SETI. For one, the galaxy is enormous with as many as 200 billion stars within it. For a targeted SETI search, each one of those stars has to be looked at directly, though there have been non-targeted searches, and more are planned. But any way you slice it, that's a lot of stars to look at, and the targeted searches tend to focus on stars that seem good candidates for hosting life. But the issue is worse than that. Any individual star can only be looked at for a few hours. They can't be monitored 24-7 year after year, which means it's eminently possible to miss a signal simply because you're not looking at the right time. For most of the galaxy, that's the exact situation Earth and human civilization is in. The vast majority of our signals are extremely weak. People often talk about aliens watching our television, but the reality is that to pick that up at any reasonable distance, which means only a few tens of light years, the aliens would need a radio telescope the size of a major city like New York. And then they'd have to be looking directly at us to pick anything up. So it seems reasonable that if alien civilizations have ever intercepted any signals from Earth, they would only be the very strongest ones. And we don't usually waste energy on sending out very strong signals when it's completely unnecessary for the uses we have for radio. And indeed, sometimes our signal strengths are intentionally capped. You don't want your local AM radio station broadcasting so powerfully that it bleeds over into other major cities' radio stations. Only specially licensed stations can broadcast with that kind of power, and then only at certain times. And even then, it's still capped at a higher level itself, and not very detectable at interstellar distances. As a result, there have only been a handful of times where our signals have been so powerful that they could have been reasonably picked up by an alien civilization. One example are certain radars, specifically one type that is no longer on the air. The Arecibo radio telescope on several occasions was used as a transmitter to map asteroids with radar. Those were among the most powerful radio signals ever produced by humans, and would have been visible long distance. But they come with two problems should aliens be out there close enough to detect them. Number one, they didn't repeat meaning that at best they are someone else's wow signal. And two, given that it's radar, these signals contained no information. It was just raw radio energy. One has to wonder how disappointed some might be if the first signal of unambiguous alien origin we pick up ends up being someone's radar. But there was one signal from Arecibo that stands apart in that it did contain information, and it was intended, perhaps half-heartedly, to be seen by an alien civilization. It was the Arecibo message sent in 1974 beamed towards a star cluster using a trick that had the effect of creating a very powerful focus signal with not that much energy invested. The signal again did not repeat, another wow for someone, but would be visible at very long distances, across the galaxy. But only once, and only briefly, so it seems unlikely anyone will just happen to pick it up. But the intent of that signal was more for celebratory purposes than it was for an actual MIDI signal intended to communicate with aliens. It was also beamed at a dense star cluster, ostensibly because there would be more chances packed in a small area for anyone to directly detect the signal. But in reality, star clusters and our galaxy's central bulge are not usually considered very habitable for life, due to the close proximity of all of those stars. Supernovas, radiation, etc. become more of a problem the more densely packed the stars are. And that brings us to types of stars to do SETI searches on. When you're talking 200 billion individual stars, some stars can be safely left off the search because they are unlikely to host life. These are giant stars and have lives only in the millions of years rather than billions for sun-like stars. 
and they tend to explode as supernovae. This would not only destroy any life nearby, it would also not be enough time for a civilization to evolve on a planet around such a star. But not paying too much attention to giant stars doesn't really mean much when the vast majority of stars in the universe are red dwarfs, with giant stars being among the rarest, so that leaves a lot of ground to search. And there is another issue. We don't really know where an alien civilization would choose to live. We live on a planet, but we're also exploring space with the eventual intent to colonize it. While I doubt we ever leave Earth completely, it's hard to say what a highly advanced alien civilization might do. For example, they may make their home planet into a fully natural nature preserve because they simply don't need it any longer. As we study exoplanets more closely, it's entirely possible that we may see exoplanets that present biosignatures, but no technosignatures despite them once having hosted civilizations that mostly left for space. So within this idea comes wild cards. Machine civilizations, for example, may not choose to be near resources, assuming they had enough, but rather prefer to find the coldest place in the galaxy for more efficient computation. That would make the outer edges of the galaxy a target for SETI, when in reality it's usually ignored because there just isn't enough material out there conducive for life itself to arise, placing it outside of the so-called galactic habitable zone. And then there are the black holes. We don't entirely know what a black hole might be useful for, but we do know that there is a significant amount of energy being produced by them. This has led to speculations about using small black holes as energy sources for spacecraft, and indeed using David Kipping's halo drive and binary black hole systems to gain an energy advantage for interstellar travel. But very little work has ever been put into searching known black holes for technosignatures, even though they may be a natural place to find them. But it's also rather difficult to detect black holes regardless, and that leads to the interstellar medium itself. Alien civilizations traversing the galaxy would literally be found in the emptiness of interstellar or perhaps even intergalactic space. This dramatically increases the real estate you need to look through in a targeted SETI search. But there's an even bigger problem. Aliens may be very long-lived, or even almost immortal. How does that change the way SETI searches for signals? Turns out, quite a lot. And it may even define what kind of signal we might receive. When envisioning a civilization like this, we must first define what immortality is. It could take several forms, such as biological immortality where the aging process is defeated and the body becomes infinitely self-repairing. A civilization choosing to do this is going to run into a statistical problem, however. It's accidental death, and the longer you live, the greater the chance that you will be killed in an accident. This is an issue that makes biological immortality virtually impossible and leads to lifespans statistically to an average in the lower tens of thousands of years or even less. To mitigate this, it might lead such a civilization to become extremely paranoid of death, basically limiting travel and any other death risks as best as can be done. It would be a civilization covering itself with knee pads and pillows to reduce any risk of death they could. But even then, eventually something will get you. Such a civilization would also likely have a static population number and only reproduce when someone dies. Going into space would be outright banned as too dangerous, so such a civilization may never venture out into the galaxy. While an extreme scenario, it does show how immortality changes the equation. Another type of immortality is technological immortality where one is literally uploaded into a computer with many backups that guarantee immortality so long as the electricity doesn't shut off. That comes with its own set of questions, not the least of which is the question of whether it's really you that uploads, or a copy. That there is hybrid biological and technological immortality, essentially cyborg immortality, where biological parts are replaced with technological ones, but never completely particularly in regards to the brain. Or maybe it does, and the brain is converted slowly to become a computer, neuron by neuron, being replaced with a technological substitute. 
containing a copy of the information of the lost neuron. Here you would very gradually transition to become a technological being, and it would still be you. Any of these options creates a social problem, however. Boredom. Living so long would eventually result in one having experienced almost everything possible in your environment. And that leads to the SETI signal. It could be that if we ever detect and decode a signal, we may discover the galaxy's mortal civilizations spend their time living vicariously through each other and learning about new experiences by recreating them in virtual reality. They may want to know what we eat, have us explain a McRib sandwich to them, or describe a pineapple all the way down to the molecular level. Then they use that information to recreate the experience for themselves, which might be particularly interesting since they may not even have conceived of a sense of taste before augmenting themselves with one. But that also brings up another question. Would a paranoid immortal alien civilization communicate at all? After all, if survival is your goal, then it's best not to draw the attention of civilizations that may pose a threat if they know of your existence. Such a civilization may choose to simply listen and monitor the galaxy for threats, but otherwise hide their existence. If everyone except us is doing that, then the Fermi Paradox is solved by immortality and an intense fear of death. But back to time. If you live on a time scale of 10,000 years, then how fast would you choose to communicate? Here, aliens become like the Ents of the Lord of the Rings, where it takes days to simply say hello. If civilization's endgame is immortality, then communication could universally be on a much larger time scale than we currently do it. And only when we reach immortality ourselves do we have the time to intercept and understand these signals. Or, if you will, the clam does not speak to the potato until the chowder is made. Time and the perception of it can alter how we think about SETI in several ways. One is how often a signal repeats, such as the wow signal once, but not see it again because either we aren't looking exactly when it comes in, or because it works on a period of very long intervals and only repeats every century or 800 years or more. And that brings up just how we perceive time as humans. That changes for us somewhat. While we perceive time ticking essentially the same throughout our lives, the brain does seem to have some ability to slow its perception of time down. This is why car accidents sometimes seem to happen in slow motion to those involved. This also works for the perception of time across one's life. I'm 45, and a year takes far less time to seemingly pass than it did when I was 5. This is thought to be because the brain has something akin to a frame rate at which it takes stock, which is likely an oversimplification that can change with situation or age. This opens the way for completely different ways an alien mind could perceive time, especially if it's immortal. And engineering in biology or technology could also alter the perception of time for an alien species. In that way, they could slow time down if desired, or speed it up, at least in the sense of perception. All of these things present a challenge to SETI and illustrates that it may be harder to pick up an alien signal than one might think. Do we live in a galaxy full of immortal aliens? And the solution to the Fermi Paradox is simply that humans are impatient. You tell me in the comments below. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently contemplating my outros. If you go back to the very first ones in 2016, they were very businesslike. Then came talk of a LeBaron, Lysoling rocks on Mars, and who could forget the anxiety over an alien probe EMPing us back into the Stone Age while broadcasting Where McRib over and over? Or maybe Where McRib. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.